The month and year is August 2013. The world record for Jack 3 any percent sits at 5726 by Lapanier, a man who had left a hallmark behind him, with nearly 10 straight minutes of world record improvement without much competition. As he moved on from the game though, a new successor to the throne was going to take his place in due time. And the few that followed the scene were projecting that it was gonna be me, as I was the only other person playing the game somewhat actively. My showcase at ESA was a big confidence boost. I did my run in front of 9,000 live viewers, which ended up being one of the highest viewed runs of the entire marathon. While I was starting to feel more comfortable playing in front of a crowd, it wasn't going to help me get the record back. I had to put my nose to the grindstone and get down to business. After returning home from ESA, I had a small dilemma to solve before submitting myself to the grind. It's time to tackle the difficult conundrum that is PlayStation loading times. So here's the deal. My last two PBs in Jack 3 Any% percent were actually set on the Jack and Daxter HD collection for the PS3. This was in large part due to the time when I was competing with a runner called Crash Pro 33 in Jack 2. For most of the competition between Crash Pro and I, he was gaining significant time on me as he was on PS3 and I was on PS2. The PS3's improved hardware allowed his time spent while loading to be significantly reduced. In regards to Jack 3 Any% percent, this is also the case, where the time save is upwards of a minute to a minute and a half. In order to compete with Crash Pro, I would seek out and obtain the PS3 version as well, but felt conflicted on the idea of swapping over in Jack 3, mainly for two big reasons. The first one being control. The PS3 version has the infamous punch glitch, where punching in certain spots can redirect Jack towards an area you weren't intending. This is most problematic in the first level of the run, the training course, where you can get thrown into the lava if you get the glitch in an unfavorable spot. This glitch sucks, especially considering the level is already extremely finicky and involves a lot of resetting. Several players have also reported input delay on the PS3 port, including myself, so overall it just feels sluggish to play on. The second reason is, well, integrity. I didn't want to beat Lapanier on a version where I knew I definitely had an unfair advantage. So for the sake of the competition, I made the choice to swap back to PS2 when I was starting to close in on his record. Despite future releases of the Jack games on PS4 and 5, Jack 3's competitive history would continue with the PS2 version. Acquiring a copy to compete was fairly accessible as well, seeing as both PAL and NTSC don't have any major differences that impact the run. Returning back to my PAL PS2 version felt great, and I was ready to take down Lapanier. The mark to beat was his 5726, which, in all honesty, was an overall worse run than his 5901. I know it might seem weird that a run over a minute and a half faster can be considered worse, but you have to put the run into context of what strategies were known at the time. Lapanier's 57 was still a solid display, but largely carried by the new yet more difficult cave skip that cut out two missions from the run. So while it wasn't exactly easy pickings, the doors were slightly open. And on September 8th of 2013, I would find myself with more than just a world record. Yeah! 56, baby! Yeah! 56! Yes! Dude! Oh my god! Yes, man! A 56 to top off my grind to beat Lapanier was an incredible feeling. My doubts had plagued me for months. I genuinely wasn't sure if I had the skills to take the record back. But now, it was here. Perhaps this was just the mental breakthrough I needed to unlock my full potential. While I was the new top dog of the game, I still felt like I needed to make a statement. Prove to myself and the world that this record was no fluke. So I kept grinding.
26, 20, 26, or 27. 56, 28. Boom! Alright, hold on, let me capture in this chat. Let me capture in this chat. The distrust I had in myself as a player completely vanished after setting this new time. A mid-56 was something to be proud of. Especially considering there was barely any new time save to take advantage of since Laponia's 57. Nearly a full minute shaved off just by playing better. I think it's fair to say that I earned my spot at the top. With me as the front runner of the game, Jack3 Any% was starting to take a different shape. Shown within these two records, you can see evidence of my vastly different philosophy on Jack3 as a speed game. It seems that Laponier's approach often focused on executing strategies correctly and staying consistent while minimizing deaths. I, on the other hand, was very intent on getting a good start. If I bonked in the training course or if satellite was a bit below average, it wouldn't be uncommon to see me just throw the run in the bin. For better or worse, I had the patience to reset a lot. Another thing I generally focused a lot more on was my movement on the jet board. Side flips were slowly becoming implemented as a core part of my game and techniques like punch boarding would be something you would see used all over the run. And going forward, it would be staple tech that is still used to this day. My improved jet boarding is most noticeable in the bottom section of the eco mine, where if we compare to Laponier's 57, it's starting to become clear that any time spent not on the jet board is time lost. For a brief moment, it really felt as if I'd gotten a grasp of Jack 3's wide array of missions. The route was starting to click, and it would be evident as I continued to improve. Now granted, all we have to show for that is a tweet from October 1st, but still, I was getting the hang of things. Despite Laponier moving away from Jack 3 entirely, I'd like to think he would have been proud if he saw how far I'd come. In just a handful of months, I'd really come into my own as a player. Between 2013 and 2014, viewership for my stream would increase, and people eagerly awaited when the record would fall once again. Some viewers watching my stream would feel inspired to join in on the fun and start running, with some also contributing to glitch hunting. A Skype group would be created by Veloxer from the SDA forum, which would contain runners from all of the Jack games. A Mumble server would be created for voice chats, and races on Speedruns Live would continue to thrive. A true golden age for the growth of the Jack community. The Skype group in particular, which went under the name Jakira's Underground, was the biggest hub the community had at the time. But that doesn't mean it was sizable by any means. Increasing the user count usually involved scouring Twitch and YouTube to see if there were any people speedrunning the Jack games that we were unaware of. Most people were happy to hear that a scene for a beloved childhood series was brewing and entered the community. We would try to do this for as many as we could, but at the time, there was one outsider in particular who was difficult to reach. So Tom Jack is like French, um, his English is really bad. That was a man. <laughs> and uh, so he wouldn't like communicate too much with the rest of the community. Tom Jack would just turn up and, and do these things. Like we wouldn't really know until it happened. Tom Jack would just kind of do, do his own thing, find his own routes. Uh, and I think a lot of that was a language barrier that he wasn't part of the community as, as tightly, but you know, we could work around it. Google Translate was not the best back then, but we made it work. Yeah, no, it seems it seems kind of like a bit as his own entity, still like part of the community, but not fully detached. But he's like he's on the sideline, just like giving us these like cookies every now and then, like you. <laughs> Around the time I was improving at Jack Three, Tom Jack was dominating Jack Two, setting numerous world records in his prime. His play style, even in the context of Jack Two was quite similar to mine, having a greater emphasis on jetboard movement and getting a clean early game. Despite the relatively transferable skill between the two games, Tom Jack never really played Jack 3 very much. But out of the blue, on October 19th, 2013, the community woke up to the latest and greatest cookie from the man himself. A Jack 3 speedrun in 50 minutes, 11 seconds, saving six minutes on the world record. Just as I was starting to get a hang of the new route, Tom Jack threw a new spice in the mix. These several minutes of time save obviously came from some new discoveries, so let's take a look at his run. 
After Lapagne had discovered that it's possible to get into the cave without the Dune Hopper, other runners started theorizing if it was possible to get into the cave at an even earlier point in the game. I mean, the 2009 segmented runs manages to get in after the second mission, so surely there's something out there. The common spot in contention was right after the satellite mission. Before facing off against Cleaver and his goons in the desert race, you must complete a small driving tutorial first. If you try to ignore this tutorial and drive straight to the cave, an out-of-bounds zone makes you fail the mission. So, further testing of getting to the cave from this point wasn't elaborated on. This is until Tom Jack discovered that you can remove the out-of-bounds zones by completing the final task in the tutorial and restarting the mission. Now the desert can be roamed freely, and you can even jump out of the vehicle. Tom Jack now makes his way over to the cave with nothing but Jack's raw moveset. With some incredible platforming skills, Tom Jack makes his way to the top of the cave wall without the Wave Concussor. This single jump took him a minute and 20 seconds to get, so it's not easy by any means. He then navigates around some invisible walls and takes advantage of several standpoints to make his way inside the cave earlier than what anyone thought was possible. This was yet another four missions completely skipped from Jack 3 Any% You now no longer had to do Desert Race, Artifacts, Leaper Race, and Metalheads 1, saving a total of 12 minutes. The route now looks like this, with only 17 of the game's total 60 missions being required to finish the game. Following tradition, we now have a third unintended vehicle for Destroy Eggs, the Tough Puppy. This one doesn't even have a gun attached to it, so how is Tom Jack supposed to destroy the eggs? His solution to this issue was rather simple. Once inside the inner chamber, taking an intentional death spawns you in the intended vehicle for the mission, the Gila Stomper, where Tom Jack does the mission faster than ever before. Not just due to having the ideal vehicle, but also because of two new restart mission warps. The first one was performed after destroying the last egg, where Tom Jack opens the menu at the earliest point he can, when the timer reaches 2.56. This puts you closer to the exit of the cave, where the second is performed upon completing the escape. As the timer disappears from the top of the screen, the warp is performed, putting you at the mouth of the cave, saving a combined 25 seconds. Before entering Palace Ruins, Tom Jack had found a small crevice in the ground where the jetboard could fit into, which enabled him to do a massive proxy jump into the level. Since he went past the trigger that's supposed to start the mission, the level is in a state where none of the enemies or breakable walls are loaded in. Finishing the mission in this state will put Jack in what's known as the Statue Glitch, a full-on hard lock where you're completely unable to move and can't access the menu. This is easily avoided by taking a death at any time throughout the level, which fortunately doesn't respawn the enemies or breakable walls. This strange way of entering Palace Ruins had a pretty significant upside, as the Mantis Metalheads jumping around are typically a major cause of time loss, but their removal would allow you to focus purely on your jetboarding. The time save regarding this trick was difficult to gauge though. Shown in this side-by-side -side comparison from Bloppy, Tom Jack finishes the mission a few seconds before me. But my 5628 had some bad luck with the enemies, so if we take that into account, it roughly evens out. It also took him over a minute to actually nail the proxy, so the viability of this was unclear. On the ascent up to Cyber Arrow, Tom Jack decided to scale the boss by using the Wave Concussor, a strategy still used in runs today. The execution of Tom Jack's run left a lot to be desired, which is understandable as he was mainly a Jack 2 runner. But still, you can't deny how wildly inventive he was with his glitch findings for the time. Useful or not, Tom Jack was a route sculptor and a boundary explorer. His run was purely a showcase of his creativity, nothing more. In the original video of when he first discovered the new cave skip, he dedicated the video in my name and to everyone else who runs Jack 3. Language barrier aside, and him not being a part of the Skype group, he was clearly invested in the growth of the game and its community. I was honored, and felt the need to do my own run with these new findings to see how far I could take it. With 12 minutes on the line, this was going to be mass destruction. I first achieved a 46.36, a world record by nearly 4 minutes. Tom Jack would actually get pretty close to beating my time, achieving a 47.17 the following day. But by this point, I was starting to run away with the gold, as I improved to 45.30, the first solid time with the new route. 
Even though there was now a big emphasis on nailing the new cave skip quickly, it wouldn't stop me from improving at other parts of the game too. In my 4636, I would finish Bomb Train faster than I'd ever done before, by hitting a strategy I coined the Magic Shot. When arriving at this location in the level, it's possible to hit the final two targets that you're supposed to hit at the end of the mission, so you don't have to get them later. But just adjacent from the final targets lies two more targets that are obstructed by a big mountain from the platform where Jack is standing. I had figured out that it's possible to hit these targets by spraying the beam reflexor and getting a lucky bounce with one of your bullets. If one of the shots happens to have a certain right tracing trajectory, I would usually leave the spot and continue with the level, hoping that I hit the targets. If I did, the mission would end right here next to this big lamp. Whereas if I missed, I would have to go a bit further into the level, missing out on a potential 10 second time save. As for further optimizations, I didn't stray away from the norm too much. I opted out of doing Tom Jack's jetboard proxy into Palace Ruins, since it felt like an unnecessary risk at the end of the run, and the time save was a bit ambiguous. Overall though, my improvement came from simply playing the game more. The increased hours I now had in the game improved my control over Jack, and it was showing in these runs. I did continue to improve the record, but the proof is pretty shoddy. It is at least known that I lowered my time into the 44s with this tweet, and I would get 4348 with this post on the SDA forums. Your, your level of like practice and like how like precise your movement was, was, was like above everyone else by a lot. That shows in the fact that you kind of consistently were the one lowering the times most of the time. A lot of people, not just in this game, but in like every speed game will kind of just get the record and then they'll be done with it. But you wouldn't just get the record and be done with it. Like you would actually like keep trying to improve it and push it further than further than you already had. You were kind of one of those players that really wanted to push it as far as you could. I was no longer a small creature in a vast ocean. For Jack 3 any percent, I was suddenly thrown into the spotlight as the guy to beat. In all honesty, I was just improving my record because I was having fun. The new route was fresh in a way, and it was exciting to see how low the game could go now. On the flip side, it was starting to become very noticeable that my speedrunning skills were improving rapidly. I'd been around the scene for well over a year now, and I hadn't just been running Jack, so having that experience was leveling me up. I was starting to feel like a new fish. By the time I was around the community, you were already at the top of Jack 3, so... I've never remembered you as someone who was ever, like, up and coming at Jack 3. You were always at the top of Jack 3, or just, like, right behind, or, like, Old Runner coming back, so... You were at the top when I... I've, I've never not known you as like a top Jack 3 player kind of thing. It's wrong to say that I haven't seen you got, like, get better. I've just always kind of seen you uh, grind it out. It's, it's pretty, pretty impressive considering how easily most people burn out. And I know you do other games to kind of balance it out, but whenever you're on Jack, it's, uh, you know, whatever, whatever it is, it's, it's coming. The name of the game for me going forward was Adaptation. Tom Jack had discovered a new route, and I had learned it fairly easily. But entering 2014, a massive curveball would be thrown right at me, and the route was about to look a lot different. Three huge tricks would all be discovered in quick succession, with the first involving our old pal, The Cave. Veloxer from the SDA forums had found one of the most unique tricks that I have ever seen in speedrunning. This trick was first showcased to the world in a YouTube video that I uploaded on January 14th of 2014. That literally involved me driving the tough puppy up to the cave wall, standing on it for a handful of seconds, getting back in the car, and... Huh. The reason this works is quite technical, so buckle up. First off, let's establish that this entire egg wall is completely solid, so passing through it in the way you just saw requires breaking things down on a more scientific level. 
Essentially, there's a massive blue sphere encapsulating the collision for the egg wall. This sphere can, for whatever reason, be moved when standing on top of the tough puppy, as long as it's parked right up against the wall. Why we can even move this sphere in the first place is something that isn't quite understood even to this day, but the theory goes that the game assumes Jack to be stuck, and tries to make room for him. Another thing that's not understood very well is the direction the sphere decides to move when Jack is standing on the car. As you can see, the sphere kinda seems to drift off in whichever direction it wants. If it drifts far enough to either left or right, it allows an opening to be created on the opposite side, where hopefully it's big enough to fit the vehicle through. In a real-time setting, you obviously cannot see the sphere, so there is a bit of guesswork involved on which side is the non-solid one. This 50-50 crapshoot was essentially solved by quickly punching over to one of the sides to see if Jack goes through the wall or not. While this trick is complicated on a technical level, it wasn't particularly difficult to execute for runners. In fact, this discovery was quite significant for newcomers trying to get into the game, as it obsoleted Tom Jack's difficult climb to get into the cave, with the initial jump being seen as one of the hardest parts of the entire any% percent run. It also saved an additional 45 seconds, so faster and easier, we take those. The second big time saver that was found was me remembering an old out of bounds that had been discovered back in 2013. During the revisit to the temple where you have to collect the tokens, Cypress managed to find a spot where you can get Jack out of bounds by squeezing through some bricks. This was thought to be useless when it was found in 2013, but after giving it another look, I realized it was possible to reach the hallway behind the token room with some precise jetboarding giving the trick its name, Token Skip, shaving off another 40 seconds. Lastly, Bloppy had modified Tom Jack's jetboard proxy to skip straight to the first checkpoint in Palace Ruins to save a full minute. It was unfortunately not possible to skip more of the level, since the first checkpoint is tied to a loading zone that you need to hit to proceed. Otherwise, this hallway a bit further into the level is just a blank void. You also have to remember to die at least once in the level when doing the proxy, otherwise you'll get the statue glitch when trying to enter BTR. All of a sudden, my PB became so improvable. I would get 4338 with the new cave skip, and 4242 with token skip and the new palace ruins proxy. The biggest problem of the three was definitely token skip. It's just an all-out fight against the camera. It takes a lot of practice to know when you clip through, and how to navigate Jack in the Out of Bounds Void while the camera is stuck on the inside. In February of 2014, I would be on a run with a super clean token skip. Throughout the mid-game, I would continue to gain time, with better movement in Eco Mine and hitting the magic shot during Bomb Train. It seems that I had achieved a 42-21 around this time, with no highlight to go with it, but I was about to destroy that. After nailing the Palace Ruins proxy on my second try, my movement through the ruins was better than ever, retaining top speed wherever I could. After golding BTR, I was now over a minute ahead on what was likely my best run of the game after nearly 3,000 attempts. It wasn't over yet though, as there were two new strats at the very end of the game that I had decided to go for. In the second room of Darkship, it's possible to save 5 seconds by landing on the second to last platform on the bridge with a big jetboard jump, which I would unfortunately miss, losing me around 20 seconds. On Terraformer, I decided to go for Fast Cycle, an 8 second time saver I had discovered that kills the boss in an earlier spot. Despite struggling to hit the last target, I still nailed the Fast Cycle and finished the run out strong. Fucking unbelievable. Good run. 41-11. Yes, dude! Mm. Fuck yeah, dude. <laughs> Finally. I felt it, man. This was the day. That run wasn't perfect, but it was fucking good. That was a fucking good run. This 41-11 was honestly the first time I truly felt I'd achieved something great. My only two big noticeable flaws were 15 seconds in Ashland from some bad luck, and 20 in Darkship from the death. It's crazy to say, but any percent was now faster than Tom Jack's segmented hero mode run from 2011. In such a short time frame, we've already come so far. Exactly a year ago, the record was 108, and we're now 27 minutes lower. Back then, it was practically just me and Lapagne taking the game seriously, but now we have what you could actually call a community. Glitch hunters like Bloppy, Katar, and Dex would become invaluable in finding skips, shortcuts, and studying the game on a deeper level. 
runners like Turley, New, and Blost, were getting respectable times in their own right. These guys motivated me to push my times lower, and would frequently race me on SRL. While there were a lot of new faces in the community now, none of them were necessarily in striking distance to take me down. Except for maybe one player who I have yet to mention. After being on top for half a year, finally, I would get my first competitor. Out of all the new Jack 3 players that were entering the scene at the time, Beatup was easily the best of the bunch. He started playing in September 2013, and would lower his PB throughout the months, with his strongest month being March 2014, lowering his time from 43.42 all the way down to 41.57, less than a minute away from my time. Beatup recorded his runs with a webcam, and if you really squint your eyes, sometimes you can see how far ahead or behind he is. A humbling time when most couldn't afford a capture card, but the gameplay would speak for itself. Beatup's runs overall looked very similar to mine. The game was at its most optimized point yet, so there wasn't much room to deviate strategy-wise. He wasn't as prolific in the glitch hunting field as a Lapanier or Tomjack, but made up for it with his overall tighter execution. Beatup's biggest contribution would be at the end of Destroy Eggs. He discovered that parking the Gila Stomper against this wall caused the turret to auto-aim onto the final egg, saving 8 seconds over driving up close. Beatup would begin to use the Wave Concussor to take out the robots in the circle room instead of Darkjack. This is something I'd already been doing in my runs, but it's still quite risky, as sometimes you die if you're in the wrong spot. It only saves 2 seconds, but more importantly, you keep your Dark Eco Meter at full, which gives you a higher chance of yellow ammo dropping on Defend Ashlyn. My 4111 was honestly pretty tough to beat, Beatup and I played what felt like every single day in April in hopes of beating it. Even during races, you could see glimpses of potential from the both of us, with several 42-minute runs, many of which were world record pace. For the first time ever, I was actually feeling the pressure from Beatup. He was closing in very fast, so I had to try to extend my lead. On April 27th, 2014, I would put together a 4101. This run nailed the jetboard jump in Darkship, but completely choked the climb on the final boss. In the description for the run, I added the possible time save together, and was determined to achieve a run in under 40 minutes. Entering May, I would get one step closer with 4048. Some nasty time loss in the mid-game really showed that with a near-perfect run, sub-40 was on the table. Beatup was really starting to hone his skills. While most thought I was the favorite to get sub-40, in my mind, he was just as capable. Throughout May, we would continue to grind away, hoping to be the first to break that elusive barrier. On May 11th of 2014, Beatup would start a run where his cave skip would go a little wonky. The gap on the right side was too small for the tough puppy to fit through, so he decided to roll jump the entire way to the checkpoint on foot. I know this video doesn't go above 240p, but take my word for it, he loses 30 seconds. Miraculously, he manages to crawl his way back to tie an unrecorded race PB he got a few days prior. Wait, it tied my PB. <laughs> wow. That's cool. Hey, I lost 30 seconds to cave skip, didn't I? On this. This is that run. Or did I reset that one? I don't know. This, this game is funny. With 30 seconds to save, B-Dub was back the very next day for redemption. He would be off to a great early game, saving that easy time from his last run, getting to around 40 seconds ahead after a decent Ashlyn. Approaching Ecomine, B-Dub just needed to keep up the pace. If I can get this right here. Got it. This could still be sub 40 even. This is a freaking run right here. 52 seconds ahead, 17 seconds to save on this split. Come on. Today. Let's get this run today. Thank you. 
Mars not very good. No! 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 Breakthrough Ruins claims yet another victim. It happened to me, and it would happen to B-Dub. The only difference here was, B-Dub still had a shot at the record. Forty twenty-four, really, because I split late. Forty twenty-four. Got it. Oh man, that should have been sub forty. Oh. You know what? That's a solid run. B Dub had finally achieved his first world record after being in second place for many months. A huge breakthrough, but perhaps a tad bittersweet. The mistaken BTR was almost exactly 25 seconds, meaning that this run was just barely on sub-40 pace. The grind continues. On May 21st, I was back on the grind, with the full split layout, with a comparison to both my PB and to B-Dub's new record. A few hours into the session, I had a run that was keeping up with B-Dub all the way until Defend Ashlyn, where I would get some bad luck and fall behind. My movement looked even better than before, with the help of a new jetboarding trick known as an extended front flip. When you're at the peak of your jump on the jetboard, you can hit L1 to do a trick, which gains you a tiny bit of height. This height can be further extended if you animation cancel the trick by hitting R1 to do a front flip. This enables larger gaps to be cleared, like this one in the temple. I noticed that I was dropping frames throughout the run, but I couldn't worry about technical difficulties. This run was good, and could sub 40 if I just kept my focus. I would extend my lead in Palace Ruins by incorporating another extended front flip. Instead of going all the way around by grinding the railings, this small gap could instead be crossed, saving 8 seconds from a more direct line. Now I was almost back to even on B-Dub and after BTR, I would gain the 25 seconds he lost. My stream was literally in the middle of dying on the final boss. Everything was running at 5 frames per second, but despite that, everyone was at the edge of their seats, as it was coming down to the wire. take that. I was afraid that I split a bit early there. I still think I got it, though. Alright, we're getting the webcam out. I was not expecting that kind of time. Um, I was expecting a little better, but whatever, it's sub-40. Holy shit, I am lucky as fuck. 39.59.84. By the skin of my teeth, I'd finally hit my goal. What a way to end the grind. Sub-40 was a big milestone for me, but I noted that the run could still be improved. In another universe, B-Dub could have just as easily been the one to achieve it too. Sometimes, speedrunning boils down to who can take advantage of the few opportunities you're given, and the stars just align for me on this very run. After the Sub-40, I was fairly certain B-Dub would take the record back in the coming days, but just as I announced the break from the category, B-Dub was right there with me. He was slowly starting to take interest in other things, and I was starting to feel burnout for the first time ever. After 4,000 attempts, it takes a toll on you. The rapid trajectory in the game's optimization was a mixture of Beatup and I pushing each other, and the route finally settling down for a while. It's almost miraculous that we've gone three months without a new huge time saver that saves a bajillion years. This wasn't necessarily because there wasn't anything to find, it was just getting harder and now Glitch Hunters had to be more abstract in their thought process. Going through BTR on foot was tested very early on, as you can access the level with Infinite Flight Glitch fairly easily. Surprisingly, the entire level does actually load, but the end mission trigger is missing behind the final barrier. So ultimately, nothing came of this. Skipping behind the yin-yang looking door was quite the holy grail. If you could find a way to get behind the door, maybe it was possible to skip defend Ashland completely, 
and do the second visit of the temple the first time through. Unfortunately, the hallway behind the door doesn't load unless you're on the right mission. Skipping into the precursor robot fight was also something many tried. As you could get behind the door, the bomb train normally blows up with the help of the Ecomine proxy. You're probably not surprised to hear this, but the boss trigger isn't there when entering the room. Bloppy, Veloxer, and Beatup tried another way. And instead of trying to skip to the boss, why not skip behind the boss? The door leading to Haven City on the other side is right there, and if reached, maybe you didn't have to fight the boss at all. The door is blocked off by a huge invisible wall, so they had to get a bit experimental. It was first found that the collision on this wall doesn't extend up all the way. They then tried to jetboard jump to an out-of-bounds rock, where they could get the jetboard stuck, potentially proxying them to the other side. After four continuous hours of trying this jump, Beatup would finally get a proxy high enough to reach the loading zone on the other side. And the result? Was a disappointing softlock. We often highlight glitch hunters as mythical beings who break our games with no effort, but it's important to showcase the trials they go through to find the skips. For Jack 3, people were going hard in the lab, but you don't always see results. For the first time ever, the game did not budge. No new skips would be found, and my sub-40 stayed as the record. As I continued to stream other Jack 3 categories, Blost had improved his any percent time to a 43-49. Good for third place, but there was a bit of a gap between him and Beatup. This would be how the top three looked for around three days. In a sea of recurring viewers in my Twitch chat, I noticed someone new, who had arrived to make a claim. A 43-14 on his first run of the game. A time that would instantly catapult him past Blost to third place. This was eerily similar to the way Laponier revealed that he had beaten my record, but this time I had my reasons to be skeptical. Surely, lightning couldn't strike twice. The claim came from an Austrian runner called Raccoon1337, and nobody had heard of him before. I remember just like one day like seeing uh, uh, this guy just having like a really good time like out of nowhere. Like it was still the time I was like not that many like great players. Like, uh, you beat up on that was about it pretty much. I was like probably like around like two or four like in that time and then it was like I saw some um, blows was around like my skill level and then it just like came out of nowhere and then just kind of uh, showed us how, how it was done. What's always amazing for me when it comes to Raccoon is just you know, how how fast he picks up games and how fast he gets good at it. Like it's whatever I play with him ever, it's he he <laughs> he beats me, floors me. He's so good at just like doing doing well, like learning and getting good at things fast. Raccoon was a perpetual lurker in my chat for months. He had been watching and analyzing my play religiously, looking for holes where he thought optimizations were possible. Raccoon practiced more than any other player before him, giving him a very mechanical and consistent playstyle. He was half man, half machine, an absolute menace on the sticks. Raccoon's PB by early July was already 4104, the same time that Beatup sat on right before achieving his first record. History would repeat itself, as on July 20th of 2014, Raccoon would skip the 40 entirely and achieve 39.45. Fuck. <laughs> hey yo, I got Jack 3 any percent world record. <laughs> Dude, did you really? Wait, yes. What? Yeah. <laughs> Where have you been? 39... <laughs> for, um... 39... 45. Yes. Dude, oh, holy shit, congrats, man. Thanks. <laughs> Raccoon's ability to see where improvements could be made was evident in this run. He was easily the best player at performing token skip, achieving the first sub-20 on the split, and by a lot too. Raccoon's jetboarding was also superb. He had a way of smoothly climbing the initial set of platforms in Ecomine without taking off the jetboard at all. And in Darkship, his bridge section looked like this. Yep, he just clears the whole thing. With a double side flip to gain full speed, jumping at the latest possible spot, 
and performing a perfect extended front flip to make it all the way across. A crazy strat for the time, and it was hit during his first world record pace. During BTR, Raccoon also standardized the technique of jumping into the sides of the breakable towers, as it redirected the angle of the car towards where you needed to go next. His play was extremely well-rounded. Rather than being good at a handful of missions, Raccoon never really seemed to show any sign of weakness. This was becoming very necessary, with the run now quite optimized. If you suck at driving, it, you're pretty much out immediately. If you suck at on-foot sections, you can't co really compete with top times. You kind of have to have everything down, at least to a certain point. Realistically, like the difficulty with Jack 3 is that there's just so much to be good at, even though it's a... Uh, you don't really think about it, but you go from on-foot to shooting sections, to car sections, to jet boarding sections, to, you know, a bunch of enemies, a boss fight. It's not quite as linear as it kind of just feels when you're playing it, because you're doing so much and it just seamlessly kind of transitions into the next thing. With Raccoon's diverse mastery over the game, 38 was perhaps in the realm of possibility. It was already kind of close after my 3959, where I said there was definitely another 45 seconds to go. With Raccoon's improved play, maybe a 38 wasn't just possible, but imminent. Was I gonna take this sitting down, or was Raccoon gonna be the one to get there first? Well, literally one day after Raccoon's record, I would answer with a 4 second improvement. As quickly as Sub 40 happened, we had already moved way past it. 39 was far from the game's final frontier. Raccoon and I were set on a collision course. Neither of us were gonna hold back, and neither of us were gonna stop until 38 was a reality. Seconds, what the fuck? That has got to be gold. That has got to be gold. Come on, man. Come on, man. Oh, baby. That fucking palace. Holy fuck, that breach was good. Oh my, double gold. It's not over, guys. I, I'm known for choking in these kinds of games. I choke. It happens. All I need is Terraformer Fast Cycle and not choke the climb. Oh my god! That's it! That's it! That's it! My mouth is so dry, dude, and my heart is just going nuts. Yes! Oh my god, dude, that's it. That's it, that's it. 38.58. Yeah! The 38 was finally achieved, and I'd gotten there first. But Raccoon wasn't done.
Holy fuck! <laughs> After the dust had settled, Raccoon and I were completely done. Like two deflated flat tires. I can't really describe how much the two of us played when the competition was at its peak. It really was a journey every step of the way competing against Raccoon. He was easily the toughest competition I've ever faced back then. And he pushed me to up my game every time he beat me. Even though we were completely out of motivation to play any further, we were okay with that. I had achieved the first 38, but Raccoon was the one who ended up with the record. A win-win in my book. I'd say that you guys had a really healthy rivalry. Like, you guys really pushed each other to go further and get better. Yeah, so getting the record for the first time was like, like mind-blowing for me. And you coming back and like reclaiming it was obviously like a huge deal for me. And I, back then I had the the power to like compete and so I did and it was so much fun to like trade the world record back and forth even if it was just a one second difference I felt the the need to compete with you and beat your time it was like like it, <laughs> it was really good yeah Raccoon and I definitely got closer after the competition Really the first time I felt that speedrunning was more than just going fast in a game. I had made a real friend, and I'll cherish the time we had lowering the record together, probably for the rest of time. I've met him several times in real life since 2014, whether it be at ESA or somewhere else. The guy is extremely chill and I always enjoy being around him. Thanks for all the good memories. The grind for the 38 changed the trajectory of my life for good. For the moment, it seemed unclear if Raccoon's time was even going to be beatable. He had come out of nowhere, seemingly conquered the game, and set an all-time great record. There was still some time to save, maybe enough for 3830, but if neither of us were playing, then it was likely going to stand at 3848 for some time. B-Dub tried to get back to the grind and would eventually land a 3943, a solid time, but his drive for the game wasn't really there. If the spark for the record was to return, it was clear that we would need a new groundbreaking discovery. And luckily, I knew just the man for the job. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, please consider subscribing or supporting me on Patreon. Take care, and I'll see you next time for Era 4.